عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول السلام عليك وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأمر لزيارتكم السلام على Let me say the ayah that I just read is in chapter 41, verse 23. The last part of this the verse, it is quoted that the Prophet received the verse when the group of Ansar, the people of Medina, they came to the Prophet. They say, Ya Rasulullah, we saw how much you have done for Islam. And what you have been through to save Islam and teachers and guides. Ya Rasulullah, can we give you some money? Can we give you something just to show how much we appreciate you? Before the Prophet could say a word or answer them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this ayah down. Ya Rasulullah, pull, tell them. La as'alukum. I do not need any reward for whatever I have done for Islam. Ya Allah. Illa al mawaddata fil qurba. That I accept one thing that I, I expect from you, my ummah, my followers. And what I expect from you is to love my qurba, my project. You know, this kind of ayah is too kind in the Quran. The same ayah, the same question was thrown to some prophet in the Quran. 
One of them is No, one of them is Lut, one of them is Shu'aib, and others, they were asked by their people the same question. And you know their response was different than the response of the Prophet in the Quran. Their response was, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ They respond, No, we don't want to reward. Our reward is on Allah. But the Prophet, his answer was different. And imagine, this is not the Prophet saying. He was told to say, look at the ayah clearly. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا Allah is telling him, Ya Rasulullah, tell those who are asking you, what, 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 what can they do for you? Allah said, tell them that all I want is to love my Qurba. But who are the Qurba, inshallah, we're going to come to that point. But the point is, this ayah talks about the importance of love because the word mawadda. Mawadda means love. And this brings us what? In the importance of love in Islam. And you know, in Islam, and as I'm going to mention, inshallah, our references to it also from the hadith or the sunnah of the Prophet. That the Prophet stated that no Muslim, your iman will be complete unless it comes through three channels. If it comes through, through two channels, you are disqualified. One channel is disqualified. It has to come from one, two, three channels because they are connected with each other. The first one, Quran said, is called Abdullah. Every Muslim have to develop the love for Allah subhanahu I cannot be a true Muslim unless I have love for Allah. And when we say love, what do we mean by the love of Allah? Meaning, I have to compare my love for other things versus the love for Allah. The love for Allah have to be the most dominant in your heart. Not my wife. Not my children. The love that I love for my wife and my children, it has to be under the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And listen to the Quran in Surah Baqarah. What did Allah say? Allah says, there are two groups of people. One group, they, took, they take other things to be their God, to be their leaders, and they love them so much. But then Allah says, Those who believe, the true mu'mineen, Allah says, Their love is strong for Allah. Allah. Everything that they love in this world, it comes under the love of Allah. One example that I want to share with you is the example of the most mentioned person in the Quran, the most mentioned prophet in the Quran, is Ibrahim and you know one of the reasons why Allah mentioned so much because he is one of the symbol of Tawheed symbol of unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now what happened this Ibrahim al-Khalil just to show the importance and the sign of love for Allah this Ibrahim al-Khalil he has so many years asking Allah to give him a son and he mentioned in the Quran Ya Allah, Rabbi la tadharni fardan wa anta khayrul warithin. Ya Allah, don't let me alone. Don't let me die without a children. I want a child. For so many years he was asking Allah. He didn't get the child. Until when? Until he was in his 70s. Some narrative said even 80s. When he was standing in his house, the angel Jibreel comes in. He and his wife, they were sitting. Allah says, Ya Ibrahim, we are here to give you a news. What is the news? Yeah, your wife is going to have a baby. Allah Akbar. The wife turned and said, Are you in today's world? And if you want to put it in his in, in today's word, it's like she wanna say, Are you kidding me? After all these years, old, these seven years, I'm gonna have a baby. Allah says sure. Because whatever Allah said is going to happen. Now what happened? This Ibrahim al khalil he had the baby according to Allah's war and Allah's promise. And that child is what we know, Prophet Ismail. Now Allah tested him, he gave him the son. The point is, this Ibrahim al-Khalil, after years of having the Ismail, Ismail became a teenager. And you know what I mean of teenager? I mean at the time, he can start to benefit from his son, sending him for errands, 
do this, buy me this, take this, bring me this. At that time, Allah says, Ya Ibrahim, we want you to slaughter that son. Allah, this is a, a great yes. But you see, Allah talks about him so much in the Quran. One of the reason is this: that Ibrahim al Khalil at that moment, and Quran said, "Falamma balagh ma'au sa'i." A sa'i is when the child is at the age where they can go errands, they go to do things together, where he can start benefiting from his son. Allah said, "That is the time that I want you to slaughter your son." What a test, man! And guess what? Not only I want you to slaughter your son. Sometimes Allah tells you, I want you to slaughter your son by having somebody to kill him. No. Allah said, I want you to do it with your son. What a tragedy, huh? Then Ibrahim al-Khalil, Allahu Akbar. He saw the dream three times. And he surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim al-Khalil, after that, he accepted. And Quran said about them in Surah Al-Safat, read careful about the story. And what did Allah say? That the son and the father, both of them, they both submitted completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَسْلَمَا وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِيلِ And it's amazing, the story, brothers and sisters, that Ibrahim, when he told, when he told his son, Ismail, يَا بُنَيَّ إِنِّي أَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ أَنِّي أَذْبَهُكْ I saw in the dream to slaughter you. فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا تَرَى See, what do you see? What do you think? Ismail alayhi salam said, يَا أَبَتِ فْعَلْ مَا تُؤْمَرْ Do whatever Allah asks you to do. سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهِ مِنَ الصَّابِرِ Not only that, then he said to his father, يَا أَبَا, oh my father, if the time of slaughtering comes, what I want you to do, ya, my father, is that I want you to tie my eyes. Allahu Akbar. What a child helping the father to obey and carry the responsibility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one. Number two, he said, then I want you to tie my hands at the back. Number three, he said, I want you to face me facing on the ground. Why? I said, because I don't want you to look at my face. Because maybe that might prevent you from carrying the mission of Allah. My hands, I want you to tie them at the back. Why? I said, because I don't want you, I don't want to fight you during the process of carrying the mission of Allah. Allahu Akbar. And that is where Ibrahim started to cry. And he said to his son, Oh my son, I will not combine all these things on you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the sacrifice by giving them another sacrifice. Now, the point is, this Ibrahim is the sign of Hubbullah, the love for Allah that every mu'min have to carry in their heart. And how do you do that? Now question, and I want us to test ourselves tonight, that if you want to know, do I love Allah the most? Or I love Allah less. How do I know? How can, how can I find in my own life that I love Allah more or less? Now, just simple example. When you go to bed tonight, the Adhan of Fajr comes, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and your time goes off. If you are able to wake up, go do your wudu, you stand in front of Allah, you do your Salat al Fajr on time, versus your eyes are still sleepy but you tell yourself no to my soul and yes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my desires comes after Allah's desires that is the sign that I love Allah sometimes I find myself in a situation Allah says this action is haram and I said that myself tells me go and do it which one would you follow Allah or yourself if you are able to say to yourself no and yes to Allah then that means you have passed the test of Allah and that means your love for Allah is stronger than the love for other things and the importance of this come here brothers and sisters that you see Quran tells us if you want to come yawm al qiyamah with being successful going to heaven they say you have to come with one thing illa man ata Allah bi qalbin they asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, what is Qalb al-Saleem? The Prophet says, Qalb al-Saleem, Qalb al-Laysa fihi siwa Allah. The heart that doesn't contain anything other than the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is love number one. Love number one, 
is to love Allah and the love should be the most and the highest love above every law that is one number two after you finish with the first one then you come to the second law and the second law is you also have to love our dear Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam more than anything else that your love for the prophet have to be the most the highest love more than anything else because Allah said in Surah At-Tawbah also as when you love me you have to love the, my dear messenger and the prophet as well and the love of the prophet has to come after the love of Allah to the point where the prophet says in the hadith لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب الناس إليه من نفسه that nobody no one can become a true believer unless he or she loves me more than they love themselves Allah what Allah you love the Prophet more than your love you love yourself meaning you are ready to sacrifice and die for dear Prophet an example of that also is our Imam that a Prophet Allah talks about him in the Quran Imam Ali in the night of Hijrah when the Prophet came and told Imam Ali, Ya Ali, I was told to leave this city tonight. And you know, the city of Mecca is the most beloved city to the Prophet. But Allah told him, you have to leave this city, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet went and found Imam Ali. Ya Ali, I was asked to leave the city. But I want you to do one thing. What is it? Ya Rasulullah, I want you to stay in my bed. The Prophet told Imam Ali, I want you to spend the entire night on the bed. But listen careful you might get killed when the non-believers come and they want to kill me and they find you you might be killed Allah. you know what Imam Ali asked the Prophet Ya Rasulullah our Tasnam will you be safe he said yes I will be safe if you will be safe I said then it doesn't matter if I get killed here or stay alive in protection of After this, Allah sent the ayah and said, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ بْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ Among the people who sell himself, he sold himself, not for the self-pleasure, ابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ He was seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاللَّهُ رَعُوفٌ بِالْحَدَاءِ that is number two that a mu'min have to be ready to sacrifice himself and give up everything for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the same cause also for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and if you want to know also which one of these is higher your love for the Prophet is much higher or your love for other things is more also you have to test yourself when Rasulullah said this is wajib this is haram which one would you follow would you follow this or that which one that is love number two in islam love number three which i want to emphasize tonight brothers and sisters and that is after you finish loving allah you finish loving the messenger there is another third love which is important in islam according to the quran which is the love of ahlul bayt the descendant of the prophet That love also is important brothers and sisters unfortunately we talk about the first one and the second one but majority of us we forget about the third one and listen the point the ayah that we just read in surah shura which is chapter 41 verse 23 i do not ask you any reward except to love my descendant who are the descendant when they ask the prophet who are the Qurba? Who are the Qurba? The descendant of the Prophet? That Allah is telling the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, tell the entire Muslims that they have to love those descendants of yours. And that love for those descendants is considered the reward of your mission that you have carried. Then the Prophet goes and explains, Who are those? They say the first one is Ali, and then Fatima, and then Hassan, and then Hussein, and then Ali ibn al Hussein, and then Baqar, and then Ja'far, and he goes through the list up to the 14 of them, plus the Prophet himself. Now, what happened? 
this as we mentioned brothers and sisters I don't want you to think that this is a matter that one group of people are saying it and not the other or this is one ethnic and not the other I want to give you some references tonight as we speak reference number one Tafsir Al-Kabir and the author is Fakhruddin Al-Razi and the same ayah Surah Al-Shura number two is called Tafsir Al-Qurtubi one of the Sunni great scholars number three another great scholar is called Zamakhshari in his tafsir called Tafsir al kashaf look at the end of this ayah and what did they say but I'm just going to share with you what they say the hadith that they quoted from the prophet and they all say the hadith is authentic the first hadith they quoted he says the prophet said ala waman mata ala hubbi ali muhammad mata shahida that is one hadith number two ala wa and i'm going to translate all the, the hadith hadith number two ala wa man mata ala hubb ali muhammad mata maghfur allah two number three ala wa man mata ala hubb ali muhammad mata mustakmil al iman ala wa man mata ala hubb ali muhammad mata jaa yawm al qiyama wal wal jannatu ma'wa he goes through the hadith one after the other the first hadith he says whoever dies in the love of Ali Muhammad is he dies being forgiven that is one hadith number two whoever dies also in love of the Ali Muhammad has a martyr shaheed he dies as a martyr shaheed who dies in the path of Allah number three Allah woman martyr whoever dies in the love of Ali Muhammad Mata Mustakmil and here I want to make an important note here brothers and sisters what he says Mustakmil Iman Mustakmil means on the full and complete Iman you know what that means if you and I die we love Allah we love the Prophet not the Ahl al-Bayt that means the incomplete Iman that's hadith number three hadith number four he said Allah woman mata ala hubbi ali Muhammad now listen carefully here brothers and sisters he said Mata ala sunnati wal jama'ah Whoever dies in the love of Ali Muhammad He dies on the sunnah and the jama'ah of Ahl al-Bayt That is one hadith And then he goes to talk about also another part of the hadith Ala wa man mata ala bugdi Ali Muhammad Whoever dies but they carry a hate of Ahl al-Bayt in their heart. What happened? He says, Mata kafir, Allah. The person is kafir. Even if they love Allah, even if they love the Prophet, the Prophet says that love is nothing to Allah and to us. Why? Because they are connected as a chain. You cannot break one and leave the other two. If you love Allah, you love the Prophet, you have to love Ali Muhammad. Otherwise, your love is nothing and you consider kafir. That's the hadith. Another hadith is mentioned. Allah wa man mata ala bugdi Ali Muhammad. Anybody who dies in the hatred of Ahl al-Bayt, he said, he will come on the day of judgment they written on his forehead a person who is hopeless from the mercy of Allah that's another hadith another hadith whoever dies but they carry the hatred of Ali Muhammad he said he will not even smell not that he will not go to that no he or she will not even smell the heaven this is how, how important the law of al -Bayt is that the jannah is connected with the law of al bayt that if you and i we doesn't matter how much we pray it doesn't matter how much we do read the quran if we carry a hatred in the heart about al bayt the prophet says not only we are not going to go to heaven we are not going to even smell that up to here I want you to give me your heart because here is my point and I want to give take home message tonight brothers and sisters and that is every Muslim today when you talk to them they will say of course we love Ahlul Bayt 
Can anybody be a Muslim and not to love Ahlul Bayt? Of course we love Ahlul Bayt. Of course. Everybody will say this. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, in the love of Ahlul Bayt, Muslims are in three categories. And I want you to define yourself which category are you in. Right? Two of them are absolutely in the wrong path. One is the right path. And I want you to know, as I mentioned, which one is right, which one is wrong. And I'm going to mention the ayahs from the Quran. How they are wrong and how are they right. Number one. Group number one, they say we love Ahlul Bayt. Right? How do they define their love? They say our love is when the Muharram comes. They come to the masjid and the center, mashallah. They beat their chest, they cry. But guess what? They don't pray. They don't fast. They don't go to Hajj. They have nothing to do with the Quran. All they do is to beat their church, and that is how they show their love to Ahlul Bayt. They say, that's what our love is about. Allah Akbar. Guess what, brothers and sisters? This love means nothing to Ahlul Bayt. That is improper. Why? Because you read the ziyarah of Imam Hussein, right? Those who are beating their chairs, listen careful and open your mind and listen in the ziyarah to what do we say about Imam Hussein? As you salute him, you said, Ashhadu annaka qad aqamta salah. One. Two. Wa atayta zakat. Three. Wa amarta bil ma'roof. Four. Wa nahayta anil munkar. Five. Wa abaqta Allah hatta ataka yaqeen. Five points you mentioned about Imam Hussein, right? What do you say? You said, I bear witness that you, Imam Hussein, you have established prayers. Meaning, that's his legacy of Imam Hussein. And you see tonight, like tonight of Tasu'a, Imam Hussein told the enemies, do not fight us tonight. Why? Because of two reasons. We want to read Quran and we want to do prayers tonight entire Karbala because in the history the Karbala is supposed to happen on the 9th of Muharram but Imam Hussein delayed it for what? for Salat and the importance of prayer not only that on the day of Ashura we have the history that Imam Hussein even he was in the battle for but he performed Salat al khawf not only that he was in the battle for he asked one of the companions to shield him so he can perform his prayer Allah you know what that tells you? That tells you the importance of Salat. So who am I? If I come and say, I love Imam Hussein, I beat my chest, but I do not want to perform prayer. That's number one. Number two, wa ta'ita zakat. We bear witness that you pay your Islamic taxes, your zakat, your homes, your sadaqah, your all the dues, you paid it. Number three, Allahu Akbar, wa amarta bil ma'roof. You, you did enjoy what is right and forbid what is good. And the fifth one, which is the most important, You obeyed Allah from the day you were born until the day you died. You were in obedience of Allah. You know what that means? That defines that the true follower of Imam Hussein is not beating the chest. What is it? It's about obedience to Allah because listen to Imam Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam he said shi'atuna man ata Allah wa aduwuna man asalli our true follower is the one who fears Allah and obeys him and our enemy is the one who disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is one of the reasons that the first group who said we love Imam Hussein but we don't want to pray we don't want to go to Hajj we don't want to pray zakat all we want to do is just to do the ma'tam. Yes, ma'tam is good. But remember, ma'tam is like an extra credit for you in the sight of Allah. The main credit is, those who have been to colleges, we have the main credit and we have extra credit. Ma'tam is important. Crying for Imam Hussein is important. But what is more important is salat and fasting and hajj and other things. That is group number one. Group number two. They said, we love Imam Hussein. Of course we love him. But how do you love him? We love him in our heart. But we don't have to follow him. Because love has to come from the heart. Right? Now listen to the Quran. In Surah Ali Imran. What did Allah say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ 
if you really love Allah you have to do what you have to follow listen love is translated into what into obedience and following it's not just I love Imam Hussein and that's it no you have to follow because the love of Allah it means nothing if you don't follow Allah the love of the Prophet means nothing if you don't follow the Prophet the same thing applies to the love of Ahlul Bayt so for those who say I love Ahlul Bayt but I don't have to follow them that love is not acceptable in Islam when I love them I have to translate that love into what? Into action. And the action is to follow what they teach in school. That's the same thing. And let me give you an example, brothers and sisters. And for those who said, love is enough by mouth, but without action. Let's say somebody who most of us, mashallah, you're married, you have husbands or wives. If your husband says, I love you so much, but I don't want to show that in my action. Or a wife says, I love my husband so much, but the love is in my heart, but I don't have to show it in my action. Would you accept that love? Your wife tells you, my wife, I love you so much. Allah is my witness, but that love is in my heart. But I don't want to show any action in that regard. I don't want to show my obedience, my love for you. It's all in my mouth. Would you accept that? Or you want to see the action? Because you know, in Islam, that the Prophet says, Al Islam Shay'ain. Islam is two things. Aqrarun bil lisan wal amal bil jawar. You say it with your mouth and then practice with your action. That's what Islam is about. So to say that I love Ahl al Bayt but I don't want to put it in the action, that is not acceptable in Islam. What is more acceptable in Islam is I love Allah and I followed Him. I love the Prophet, I follow Him. I love Ahlul Bayt and I follow them. Now let me add to this brothers and sisters that when we talk about the importance of love you go to the Prophet himself and it's mentioned in the hadith at Tirmizi at Tirmizi and Ahmed bin, Ahmed bin Hanbal in his book called Musnad. What did he say? He said one day he was sitting the Prophet was sitting with his companions and Imam Hassan and Hussein they walk in and now I'm gonna go into the details about who are the Ahlul Bayt and what did the Prophet say about them then the Prophet saw Imam Hassan and Hussein as they come in he says took they come to the Prophet he said Allahumma inni uhibbu hadain Ya Allah I want you to be with me I love these two children Allahu Akbar and wa abuhuma I love their father wa ummuhuma and I love them you know that clarifies who are in bed. The person I love these two children, I love their mother, and I love their father as well. That is that is number one. Hadith number two from Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i, one of the four school of thought. What did he say about the love of Al Bayt? And you can find his saying in Tafsir Zamak Tafsir al Kabir, Tafsir Fakhr al Razi. He quoted what a Shafi'i said about it. He said in kana hubbu ali muhammad rafdan because they call people who love al bayt al rafdi means those who reject the companions he says fashhadu i want to you to all be my witness and he's talking about whom he said jinn and the humans be my witness that i bear witness that i am the rafdi well who they call the rejectors meaning he wants to say, no matter what you call me, call me what you want to call as long as I am in love of Ahlul Bayt. That is Shafi'i. Another one he said, the same Shafi'i. He said, Ya Ahl Bayt al Nabi, ordered to the descendant of the Prophet, Hubbukum Fardun fil Qur'an anzalahu. I said, let me tell you the entire of my lesson careful. He says, your law is one of the things Allah has made mandatory in his book. In, in, in his book. Min al -qadr. It's enough honor for you, Ahlul Bayt. That whoever performed their prayers, but fail, fails, 
to send salawat to you, the descendant of the Prophet, his salat is void. And you know that we all, the brothers and sisters, that in our prayers we always said, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Who do who are those who are ali Muhammad? And you go to what we call Salat al Ibrahimiyyah, we all memorize it. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta wa barakta wa tarahamta wa tahannanta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim. Fil alamina inna ka hamidul majid. Here you mention Ali Ibrahim, right? And then you mention Ali Muhammad too. In the Quran, there are so many people Allah mentioned their descendant. One of them we all understand is called Al Imran. Al Imran. Surah Al Imran is one of the surahs. Another ayah in the Quran about the Al, Allah talks about Al Dawood. Al Ibrahim. They all mention in the Quran. But why is it that today we don't hear Ali Muhammad? Why is it that today we say we love Ali Muhammad but we don't feel that what Ahl al-Bayt feel? And in one hadith also Tirmizi mentioned, he says, the Prophet say about Ahl al-Bayt, he says, that I'm at peace with whomever you are at peace with and I'm at war with whomever you choose to be at war. Not only that, you come to the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, we all heard the hadith of the Prophet that the Prophet sits on the member, he's given khutbah, and Imam Hassan walks in, the Pro and Hussein, the Prophet cuts his khutbah and goes down and picks them up and goes back on the member. And he says to the people, all of us, Allahumma inni ahabbuhuma. Allah bear witness, I love these two. Allah. Not only that, another hadith from the Prophet, he says, Al-Hasan wal Hussein, Sayyidai Shabaab Ahlil Jannah. Allahu Akbar. Al-Hasan and Hussein, they are the youth, are the leaders of the youth. My brothers and sisters, Allah, I want you to think about this hadith carefully. When the Prophet said they are the masters or the leaders, and you and I, we want to go to heaven, don't we? Now, how would you like to follow your master in order to get to where he is for him to be your master? Now, you and I, we want to go to heaven. For us to go to heaven, shouldn't we follow the example of Hussein and Hassan? Shouldn't we follow that example so that at least when they go to heaven, we know how did they get to heaven so I and you can get to in heaven so they can be our master. Now, ask you and yourself. Let's ask ourselves. How do we follow Hussein? How do we follow Imam Ali? How do we pull Ahlul Bayt to get to that point? And the Prophet said clearly. Another hadith about them. The Prophet says, Al Hasan wal Hussein Imaman in Qama aw Qaada. Allahu Akbar. That Imam Hasan and Hussein, they are Imams, whether they are standing or they are sitting. That is the Quran, the hadith of the Prophet, emphasizing about the love for these two, two for these two grandson of the Prophet. Now all the brothers and sisters. The narration said when the ayah was revealed, in Nama Yuridullah Liyudhiba and Kumurisa Ahl al Bayt, wa yutahira kum tathira. Also go back to the tafsir and check the hadith as well. The Prophet for six months, six months after this ayah was revealed, the Prophet goes and knocks at the door of Fatima and he says, Assalamu alaikum ya ahl al Bayt. The Prophet, six months, not one month, not one, no, six months, the Prophet goes and say, Assalamu alaikum, ya ahl al bayt, on every single day. You know what that tells you? At least, at least, the least we can do in following the sunnah of the Prophet is to say exactly what the Prophet said, Assalamu alaikum, ya ahl al bayt, because those ahl al bayt that the Prophet is calling them, is calling referring to the house of Zahra and in the house of Zahra there is none of his wives in that house those who were there was Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein that's it now another hadith about the love of Ahl al-Bayt and this is quoted from Umm al muminin Aisha one of the authentic narrators what did she say when they asked her about Ahl al-Bayt she said she said I know I do not doubt that the messenger he loves Ali dearly 
he loves Imam Ali so much. One, two. And I know that the Prophet loves Fatima. And he even said, Fatima to badaatum minni. Fatima is part of me. Allahu Akbar. Then he said to Anmal Hassan, as for Hassan, I don't doubt that he loves him so much because the Prophet says, Al Hassan wal Hussein minni. Al Hassan and said, they are from me. Allahu Akbar. And one hadith the Prophet says, Hussein minni wa ana min al Hussein. Ahabba Allahu man ahabba Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. And may Allah love everyone who loves Hussein. That is Imam, that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is referring about the importance of love for Ahlul Bayt Alayhi Wasallam. But what happened brothers and sisters? Not only that, you go to another hadith about the importance of love of Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet says, لا يمر أحدكم على الصلاة يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن أربع none of you my umma who will cross the sirat and what is the sirat the sirat they says أدق من الشعر is the path that we all have to take to heaven or to the hellfire for that sirat Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Kaf وإن منكم إلا واردها كان على ربك حتما whether you like it or not everybody has to cross that sirat and that sirat is the path that you cross and you underneath of it is the hellfire and that's a lot the narration said some people will cross as fast as lightning some people will cross as fast as an air like airplane some people will cross like a car some like horses some will even crawl depending on your iman right the prophet said nobody no human being will cross that sirat unless he or she answered four questions Question number one. And Umrah, Allah will ask us our lives. How did you spend the life? Your life, the entire life that Allah gave you, how did you spend it? Did you spend it? Did I spend it? And the running behind my own pleasure or I spent my life in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is one. After you finish that question. Question number two. We will ask about the youth. That particular age is special in the sight of Allah. How did you spend your youth? Did you spend it in the right way or the wrong way? That is number three. Number four, the Prophet says, "Wa yusalu an malihi fi maktasabha wa fi ma anfaq." The money that you earn. One, how did you earn it? Two, how did you spend it? You have to answer Allah. That's the question number three. Question number four, an mahabbatina ahlul bayt ali. The fourth question the Prophet said every one of us will be asked is that we all will be asked about the fourth question How did you treat the love of Ahlul Bayt Did you love them the way the Prophet loved them or did you love them in the way? That is to tell us the importance of the love of Ahlul Bayt That is one of the questions in, in, on the Day of Judgment that is why when Surah Al-Takathur was revealed, ثُمَّ لَا تُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ When Allah, when they ask the Prophet, what is that Naim? When Allah says, on the day of judgment, you will ask about the greatest blessings. Then the Prophet, when they ask him, he says, النَّعِيمِ هِيَ وِلَايَةُ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ عَلَيْهِ That wilaya, that the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam is one of the biggest ni'mah. And that is why the ayah we read in Surah Al-Shura, when you read it carefully, at the end of that, Allah says, Inna Allah ghafoorun shakoor. Shakoor is all grateful, right? Shukur, grateful. Now listen careful. When are you going to be grateful to someone? You are grateful to someone when they do something good for you. When they render something blessing to you. Now because Ahlul Bayt are ni'mah, at the end of the ayah, Allah says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَةِ At the end of the ayah, says, وَمَنْ يَكْتَرِفُ حَسَنَةً نَزِدْ لَهُ فِيهَا أُسْنَةً إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ 
because that at little bit is a ni'mah Allah has given to all mankind and we need to understand and appreciate that ni'mah of Allah and that is why the eye says shakur not only the brothers and sisters the importance of Ahl al-Bayt when we come to the Hadith is so much to talk about. Here, you have a Hadith from both school of thought where they emphasize about the importance of love of Ahl al-Bayt. Today, we have to go back to understand about those who are Ahl al-Bayt. And here, let me see these brothers and sisters. Why Ahl al-Bayt is so important? Here's the message. Because we said, the Prophet and his teachings, there are two ways we can get it. One way is, through the companions one way is through his descendant now brothers and sisters this is just for the aql to work on our, on our brain if you really want to know someone properly in the way he deserves do you ask the neighbors or you ask his family if i want to know you how you live your life what you do what you don't do what is your schedule should i ask the neighbor who lives close to him or i should ask those who are in the house with you on him who lived with him day in and day out and they see him every single moment and they know everything about him and that's why we say Ahlul bayt adra bima fil bayt. the people of the house know what the house contains and that is why we say Ahlul Bayt is the one we need to follow. Because they see the Prophet, they live with the Prophet, they saw him every time, and they know what the Prophet does in and out. More than any companion you ever imagine, you ever know in the history. And that is one of the reasons we say Ahlul Bayt are the ones we need to follow and support. Because they know about Islam more than any person else. is Ahl al-Bayt but what happened to those Ahl al-Bayt after all this emphasis that the Prophet and the Quran pays on them continuously those Ahl al-Bayt were the ones who were brutalized all over the place they were killed all over the place they were exiled all over the place they were hated everywhere in the world that even the city of their prophet, the city of their father, became a place they are not longer welcome in that city. Allah, that day I was researching about Ahl al-Bayt and I saw one of the great grandson of the prophet was buried in Russia. Look at where Russia is and look at the Medina, which is the city of the prophet. What is he doing all the way in Russia? Because of the exile. Some of them, I got to the point, they cannot even say that we are the descendant of the prophet because when they say that it cost them their lives some of them they end up where in africa and that is not the seed of their prophet but because of the exile execution torturing they have to live all far away from the city of their prophet and this is what the prophet left for this home right and let me tell you brothers and sisters you go to Lebanon today as we speak Prophet Isa alayhi salam he was riding a donkey or horse according to the narration and just the footprint of the donkey the Christian saw and you know what they did out of respect for the Prophet Isa alayhi salam they built a church and they honored that footprint and not footprint, not footprint of Isa no the donkey he was riding but now look at the ummah of Prophet Muhammad that the Prophet left this descendant for them and he told us in the day of Ghadir please do take care of my descendant and what did we do with them torturing them killing them, exiling them, doing everything the Prophet, even one narrator said, if the Prophet were even to tell the Ummah to punish his family, he said they wouldn't do even worse than what they did. That to the point where, you see the Ummah, they invited the Prophet, son, Imam Hussein alayhi salam to Karbala with their own letters and they turned against him and killed him. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, like tonight brothers and sisters, he was sitting with his companions and his sister Zainab alayhi salam she came she said ya akhi my brother you know the time is tomorrow tomorrow is the day of Ashura and you know that 
that these people are going to kill you and your companions. But I'm afraid that those companions might not stay with you. They might leave you. As they did with Muslim Bunaqir, your ambassador. Imam Hussein asked his sister, what do you want me to do? She said, I suggest you to test them. If they're real companions and they were willing to stay with you. Imam Hussein alayhi salam then gathered all the companions and they all sat next to him. And he gave them the khutbah that night. And he said to them, I urge every one of you that if you decide to leave, you're welcome to leave. Allah. And if you decide to stay, you're welcome to stay. But if you decide to leave, I say, I decide, I urge you to leave tonight because it's almost, it's already dark. So in case you don't feel shy for leaving the same place, and so that you don't feel that you, you, you don't feel guilty for leaving me. Allah. That is when one of the companions called Zuhair ibn Al-Qayn, he stood and he looked at Imam Hussein and he said to him, why should I leave you, oh, the grandson of the Prophet? When I know for sure that you and I, we are the servant of Allah, and I know that you are the grandson of the Prophet, and how would I answer the Prophet on the day of judgment? When he asked me, why did you abandon my grandson? He said to Imam Hussein alayhi salam, if I will get killed and die and brought back, and brought back to life 70 times, I'm not going to leave. And the entire companions, they all say the same thing. After they all say the same thing, what happened? Imam Hussein alayhi salam said to Abu al-Fadl abbas his brother. He said, Ya Abu al-Fadl abbas kull al-qawm, tell the people, and you giluna sawadaha bidil layla. To allow us tonight, li nusalli lillah. And I want you tonight to take this message from brothers and sisters. The message of Imam Hussein tonight for all Muslims, is to spend the night in prayers and read the Quran. And that tells you the importance of these two things, Quran and Salat, brothers and sisters. That Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he and his companions, they spend the entire night in doing these two things. The narrator says, وَكَانَ لَهُمْ دَوِيٌّ كَدَوِيٍّ نَحْلٍ They had a very amazing look. One of them is standing, the other one is in the state of Ruku, the other one is in the state of Sajda. They all were in the form of prayer. The others are in the state of Dua. And that is what Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he and his companions spend the entire night with. It's all about prayers. Because they want to take as much as reward as they can tonight. Because they know the next night, in 24 hours, they all will be killed. They all will be dead. The narration stated that they were in this stage until what happened? Until the narration stated that one of the wife of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, she came forward. When she came forward, she came forward with his son. And that son is called Ali al -Asrar. You know, Imam Hussein alayhi salam had three children, three sons. One of them is called Ali al Akbar. The other one is called Ali al Awsat. The other one is called Ali al Asghar. And Imam Hussein loved the name Ali. And he said, and he wanted to be saying, he said, Wallahi law wulida li alfa gulam la sammaytu kulluhum bi Ali. If Allah is to provide me with 1,000 sons, he said, I will call all of them Ali. There is Imam Ali, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So the wife brought a son called Ali al Asghar. Ali al Asghar was only six months old. He was infant. He was still nursing. The mother brought him to his father. He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, there has been three days in this tent. And we are lacking water. We are lacking food. She said, I cannot nurse this baby anymore. My milk is dried. Can you please take this son of mine and tell the enemies to at least provide him with water? The narration stated that Imam Hussein alayhi salam took him from them. And what he did, he brought him in the front of the enemies. And he said to the enemies, Look, my enemies, if you think I'm the criminal, I'm the bad person, but what is the crime of this infant? 
I'm the one who came here to fight you. But this innocent child didn't come here to fight you. Please have a mercy in your heart and provide him with the water. The narration said, what Imam Hussein said this, the army of Muslim, or the army of Omar bin Sa'ad, they divided into two. Some of them, they said, please give him water. Listen to Hussein, give that baby water. At least take the baby from him and make sure that he get water and then return him back to his father. The narration stated, the other group said, no, don't give him water. He was just planning to get the water for himself, not the infant. Imam Hussein said, if that is what you think, you take the child, take the infant, give him water and then return back to me. Umar bin Sa'ad, he saw the soldiers divided into two. Some say, please give him water. Some say, please don't give him water. Then the, the dispute started among the armies. Immediately, Umar bin Sa'ad said that, to one of the best shooters of that time and it's called Harmala Lanatullahi Alayh. I said to Harmala, Ya Harmala, I want you to shoot this infant, kill this infant to end the dispute among my army. Then Harish said that Imam Hussein was holding this infant in his hand, looking in the sky, talking to Allah. Ya Allah, what kind of people are these that they don't have a mercy on the women or children? Allahu Akbar. The narration said this Harmala, he took his arrow out and then turned it towards this infant and then shot the arrow towards the Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein was looking in the sky. Suddenly he saw the baby was moving. And he looked at the baby, he saw the movement was unusual. It's more than he expected. He looked down and he saw the blood was pouring from the neck of this child. Imam Hussein looked and he saw that the infant was slaughtered from one jugular vein to another jugular vein. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he put his hand under the neck of his son. His hand was filled with the blood. He then said, Ilahi la yakunanda hadha ahwanu alayk min fasil naqati sala. Oh Allah! This crime shouldn't be less crime compared to those who killed the camel of Salah alayhi salam. He then put his hand again under the neck of Ali al-Asghar. The hand would fill with the blood. He then put wipe it on the face of his son. And he said, Hakada uridu an talka jaddaka Rasulullah. That is how I want you to face your grandfather Rasulullah with your own blood covered with your face so that your, your, your grandfather knows how the Ummah treated us after him. Then Harish said, Imam Hussein turned back to the tent where the infant was killed. The mother of the infant is the issue now. How to tell the mother that the son is already killed? When she saw him, she said, Ya Aba Abdullah, Hal Sakaita Ibni Ma'a Wajitani Ibni Ma'a did you give my son water and brought me the left of the, the leftover of the water? Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He looked at her and he said, Khudi waladake madhubuha min al warid ila al warid. As I take your son who has been slaughtered from one jugula vein to another jugula vein. When she heard this, and you know the mothers with their children, she screamed and she said, Allahu Akbar. I never expected you to become shaheed. And I know that you will become shaheed. I will prepare you like other shuhada. I didn't know that you will be killed. I didn't know that you will earn this. Ya Allah Abdullah, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, when he gave the son back to his wife, look at brothers and sisters, one of the most difficult part is here, because killing Ali al-Asghar was one of the most difficult things on Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Imam, Imam Zayn al-Abidin said, of all the tragedy of Karbala, the one that got me the most is killing my brother Ali al-Asghar. They said, because we were not expecting that these people will even dare to kill any child, even especially somebody like Ali al-Asghar. Imam Hussein, Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam, he said, the narrative said, after the tragedy of Karbala, he kept asking, Ya Allah, 
day the Harmala is still alive? They tell him, yes, he's still alive. Until the day Muqtar al-Thaqafi was able to bring Harmala to the justice, where Harmala was killed, the narration state. Imam Zayd al-Abidin, when he heard, he said, Alhamdulillah, he immediately went to the sajda, and he said, Alhamdulillah, ala katl al-Harmala. Praise be to Allah for killing this man. Why? He said, Because Harmala has hurt us too bad. And he says, Allahumma adhikuhu harmala taharra al-hadid. Ya Allah, let this harmala taste the toughness and the difficulty of iron the way he let my little brother taste it on the day of Ashura. The narrator said the most difficult part is here on the day of Ashura. Imam Hussein alayhi salam wanted to bury his son. And that was the most difficult part. He brought his son Ali al Asghar. And the moment he started to dig the grave, the narrator said that he becomes unconscious. Because he remembered this child of him, who they said also, he was resembling the Holy Prophet. So when he brought him to bury him, he said, when he digs the hole once, then he sees a Christ, another. Then he digs another hole, then he cries another. And the wife was also with him. The narration said that all of them were together and they all were crying for the killing of Ali al Asghar. The most important part is when Imam Hussein was buried in him, he said, Assalamu alayka ya Ali al Asghar, balik salami ila jaddika Rasulillah. He said to his son, Oh, I want you to send my salam to your grandfather and tell him sooner or later we are going to join you guys in that part of the world the narration said that was where the entire group of Al Bayt they couldn't hold it they all busted in the cry inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu ayya munqalam yanqalibun wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen